Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillahirrabbilalamin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah. Senang sekali pada malam hari ini saya akan berbincang-bincang dengan salah seorang rabi yang terkenal ya. Terkenal bukan hanya di suatu tempat tapi menurut saya sudah mendunia. Yaitu rabi Tovia Singer ya. Hanya di channel Donditan dan Geraha Mualaf Jakarta. Uh, saya sangat senang sekali pada malam hari ini bisa berbincang-bincang dengan Rabi Tovia Singer yang tentu saja bukan Rabi Kaleng-Kaleng ya, bukan Rabi KW ya. Nah, Alhamdulillah nanti kita akan berbincang-bincang dengan beliau mengenai perspektif daripada Yudaisme terhadap kekristenan dan Islam. Ya, ini tentunya akan sangat menarik. Mungkin ini adalah topik-topik yang umum gitu ya. Topik yang awal, nanti kita akan mendengarkan langsung dari Rabi Tovia Singer. Dan Rabi Tovia Singer sangat senang bisa muncul di channel Donditan untuk menyapa dan sekaligus menjawab pertanyaan-pertanyaan ya yang ya pasti dari saya juga dari para pemirsa di Indonesia yang menjadi pemerhati daripada apologet Islam dan Kristen. Nah ini adalah sebuah kesempatan yang sangat langka. Untuk uh, awal saya ingin memperkenalkan Rabi Tovia Singer ya sebagai seorang Rabi ya yang cukup ternama dari kalangan Yudaisme. Beliau juga mempunyai sebuah uh, semacam organisasi atau yayasan yang bernama Outreach Judaism ya. Nah apa saja yang dilakukan oleh uh, Outreach Judaism itu nanti kita dengarkan dari Rabi Tovia Singer ya. Nah, tanpa memperpanjang waktu lagi, saya akan segera menampilkan Rabi Tovia Singer. Assalamualaikum, Rabbi. Assalamualaikum, Shalom. Very good to see you. Thank you. I I still cannot believe that I can talk to you tonight, actually, Rabbi. It's, it's magic. It's amazing thing because we're amazing. I'm in Jerusalem. You're in Jakarta. So yeah, yeah, it's wonderful. This is the magic of uh, the technology, Rabbi. Yeah. Before I ask you, or uh, before I start the talk show, Rabbi, I want to show you something. Wow. Yes. <laughs> Two books, not wow. only one. <laughs> yeah, para pemirsa, ini adalah buku karangan dari Rabbi Tovia Singer yang berjudul Let's Get Biblical. Buku ini sangat uh, bagus isinya ya. Saya sering pakai. Rabbi, I I use this book I use this books a lot whenever I have some debates with the Christians, especially regarding the prophecies of Jesus in the Old Testament. Right. Ah, uh, and I also have this. The Beautiful. Tanah. Beautiful. The Stone Editions. I also have this, the GPS. Beautiful. So yeah, I learned a bit about Judaism and about Tana, but uh, I use this, uh, the knowledge of uh, Judaism and also Tana to discuss and to have some uh, dialogues with our fellow Christians, because uh, you know, the Christianity have a lot of activities around the world to convert people outside the Christianity, right, Rabbi? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So to start our discussion, I inform you, I inform the audience that you have an organization. It's named uh, Outreach Judaism. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you tell us a bit about Outreach Judaism and what do you do in this organization, Rabbi? Go ahead, Rabbi. Sure. Thank you again for having me on. It's really a joy to join you and and viewers uh, throughout Indonesia and the world. I uh, our work is devoted to helping Jewish people who've become Christians, who are thinking of becoming Christians, uh, come back to the Jewish faith, come back to Judaism, and therefore I was very fortunate to be able to spend uh, five years in Indonesia, just where you are. Because most people around the world, when they think of Indonesia, they think of a, a country that's all Muslim, 
but they don't realize that Indonesia has a very significant and very aggressive Christian community. Millions of, tens of millions of Christians. Most people don't realize that Indonesia is the fourth largest country in the world. So as a result, I help Jewish people around the world learn about Judaism and help them leave Christianity, come back to Judaism, come back to the Torah of Moses of blessed memory. It's very exciting. Very good, Rabbi. So, uh, are, are there a lot of Jew Jews that uh, converted to Christianity, Rabbi? Well, you know, there is apostasy <laughs> in the Bible, in Tanakh, in the Holy scriptures where Jews worship idols. It's very simple. And the problem has not gone away. When God warns us, do not worship any of God and the prophets of blessed memory, who were the prophets? They were the greatest people that ever lived. What was their great concern? What were they worried about? They were very worried about Jews who were worshiping idols and non-Jews. So therefore, it's a very serious problem that goes back all the way uh, back to the beginning of men. And I'm very grateful to be able to help my brothers and sisters come back to their faith and help people who are not Jewish understand. There are many people who are not Jewish who want to understand what is Judaism about and why doesn't Judaism worship Jesus. Uh, and we... I, I think that the majority of the people who watch me, who listen to my lectures, who read my books, probably not Jewish. Um, so it's very exciting work. Yeah, Rabbi, can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Rabbi. So uh, actually, I have a lot of questions for you, Rabbi, uh, from me and also from the audience. So uh, I hope if you don't mind, you can answer me in short. But if you think it is uh, quite important to explain, you can go a little bit longer. Okay, Rabbi? Go ahead. Okay. So uh, number one, this is for our audience. Actually, what is Judaism and who founded Judaism? And uh, is it considered that Judaism is considered as a religion for Jews, Rabbi? Okay, so Judaism began with the first prophet, and that's Adam, long before the term Judaism was used. Judaism is the faith of the God who Abraham came to worship, who Noah, a blessed memory, served, who Isaac loved, who Jacob adored and worshipped him alone. So Judaism is the ancient faith of monotheism, Tawhid. One yes. God and no other. Yes. All Muslims know the word la ilaha, la ilaha illallah. There's no God but the true God. That's the foundation of Judaism. So number one, there's one God and no other. We worship no one else. We worship no prophet. We worship no man. We worship no woman. Only God. That's very important. And because God is all-powerful and he is alone, he therefore must be a God of mercy and love because the oneness of God, why is it so important that there's one? Why, why is this so critical? Because if there's one God and he's all powerful, that means he didn't need this world. He doesn't need you or me. There's nothing you have that you can offer God. And therefore he must be all merciful and all loving. And therefore Judaism is connecting with God in worship and reverence, and love, and seeking out his mercy. So it's a very ancient faith that goes back to the beginning of man. Okay. Thank you, Rabbi. So, uh, I'm sorry if I forgot. Uh, before we go further with uh, another questions, can you tell us a bit about how to become a Rabbi in Judaism? And uh, should a rabbi marry? <laughs> the answer, the first answer is that studying to be a rabbi is a lot of devotion, of studying Torah, uh, the prophets, the writings, the holy books of Judaism, and devoting your life to that. And, you know, 
who doesn't want to study the word of Hashem, the word of God? I mean, is there something more wonderful than that? So, uh, a rabbi is not like um, like a like a pope or anything like that in Christianity. It just means a rabbi is really somebody who's a teacher. That's all it means. There's no, there, there's nothing a a rabbi can perform that someone who's a religious Jew who's not a rabbi cannot perform. Okay, but mm-hmm. if someone knows that this person is a rabbi, they know that they can ask that person questions. But it means much devotional study. And should a rabbi be married? Every person should be married. God mm-hmm. called us right from the beginning to that a man should cleave unto his, to leave his parents, cleave unto his wife, and they should become together. So uh, marriage is very important in Judaism. Okay. Thank you, Rabbi. So actually, this is, I believe this is the most, uh, the people ask you about this. Yeah. Is uh, Jewish Christianity and Islam worship the same God? Rabbi. No, not at all. Okay. Uh, Islam and Judaism worship the same God. One God, no other. The tragedy, yeah, the, the, the tragedy with Christians is they also believe in the true God. Every mm. Christian believes in the true God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. But there is a shirk, a partnership, where they also worship Jesus as God, as the Son of God. This is very dangerous. And they worship the Holy Spirit as a, as a separate person from God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. So this, in Judaism, is the most dangerous thing. Because mm. it's not like, you know, if you go to Bali, right? Bali is beautiful. But also, yes. one of the things you see in Bali is many statues and idols all over, right? Yes. Correct. So this is this is problematic. But Christians worship the true God. But they also worship Jesus as a God, as the Son of God. This is very dangerous. So therefore, the Christian view of God is a trinity, which is very, very dangerous. And it's against the will of the prophets of Israel. Yes. Wow, I I'm very happy that we are worshiping the same God, Rabbi. Yes. But uh, in the perspective of Judaism, you say it is very dangerous to worship uh, Jesus as God. Right. What do you call a people who worship another person, Rabbi? In 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 the uh, in the uh, Judaism, it's called uh, avoid the which means a strange worship. It means an alien worship. It's the kind of worship that Torah says is forbidden. It's the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods upon my face. Now, as I, I mentioned, of all the kinds of strange worship, meaning not worshiping God alone, the true God, the worst thing you can do the worst kind of strange worship, the worst form of avodah that's in Hebrew, is to worship the true God, but also, in addition to the true God, worship another God, separate. This is, in Arabic, it's called a shirk. Shirk, in, yes. A sh- shirk. It's the, in, in the Quran, it's the worst sin that God won't even forgive you for that. The worst. Yes. In Judaism, it's the same. That a, a in Hebrew, shutfis, which means the same thing, partnership is forbidden because it's like this. It's like the difference between uh, fornication and adultery, right? If two people who are not married, a man and a woman are together, but they're not married, that's a sin, right? But it's much worse if a, if somebody is married, if a woman is married and sleeps with another man. You follow? So if you are married to God, meaning your connection is to God, and then you have somebody else outside of the marriage, that's the worst thing possible. It's much worse than just bowing down to a statue. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much, Rabbi. 
uh, okay so we can go deeper so because you say that uh, Judaism and uh, Islam worshiping the same God yeah can you say that the tetragrammaton is equal to Allah in Islam Rabbi? so there are many names for God in Tanakh yes uh, there is a name in Tanakh that's the same as Allah is in Arabic, and that's Elohim. Yes. So we have to be very careful with the names of God. One thing I want to say to your viewers is normally religious Jews, we say God's name only in prayer or reading straight from the Bible. But I, I want to be sure that people don't misunderstand me. What does okay. Elohim mean? What does Allah mean? So in Arabic, Allah means the true God, means the God, right? But what what does that word come from? What does that word mean? Now, in, in Islamic tradition, there are almost a hundred names of God, right? Mm. Why? Because the names have a meaning, convey a message, okay? Yes. So the name Allah really comes from a word, a Semitic word, which is Al, which means powerful, that mm -hmm. God is all powerful. In English, we would say Almighty. So Elohim in Hebrew, see, it's the same root, El, Elohim in Hebrew would be the exact equivalent of the word Allah. Mm. Because, it, and that's why in the book of Genesis, the first chapter in all the Bible, yeah. that name Elohim is used only alone. There's no other name for God. All right. So this name of God conveys that God is all powerful. Mm -hmm. That's the equivalent name of the name Allah that Muslims invoke. The tetragrammaton, which Jews do not pronounce, conveys that God is eternal, that he has no beginning. He's not only in the present, but he's also eternal. So God is eternal. There's no beginning and no end. He's past, present, and future. That's something mm -hmm. that's beyond our ability to comprehend. We believe that. We all believe, you and me, we all believe that God is eternal. He has no beginning. He has no end. But we cannot, as human beings, comprehend that. We can believe that in our faith, but we can't comprehend infinity, something that has no beginning, no end, because our world is finite. So therefore, we don't use that name. We don't invoke that name. We read it. We understand this message, but we don't say it. But the, again, to answer your question, Allah and Elohim would be the same name conveying the same message. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Rabbi. Sure. So you, you mentioned about Bereshit in the chapter 1, verse 1, 2, 3. Yeah? Mm -hmm. In the Christian Bible... This Elohim was uh, understand as a spirit. Yeah. In fact, in the Tanakh Bible, it used the word ruah, right, Rabbi? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, is it correct the translation from ruah become spirit, Rabbi? Is it is it wind or spirit from your perspective? Uh, <laughs> okay. So, in Hebrew, the word spirit and the word wind is the same exact word. Yes. So it's correct. not either. so let's take so the word ruach in Hebrew. By the way, it's the same in Greek. The word yeah. in Greek for wind and for spirit is the same Greek word. But let's stick with Hebrew. The word ruach means spirit and it also means a wind. And the, the reason it's the same is easy to understand. You can't see the wind itself. We can't see wind, but we can see what effect the wind has on a tree, on other things. And so it's it's an unseen movement that we can apprehend. Um, the, the Spirit of God is not a separate deity different from God. It means the presence of God that we can apprehend. Just as we can feel the wind but can't see it, you could feel the wind blowing on your face, you can't see it. Uh, we can feel the presence of God. We are created for this. A dog cannot. But we, every person is created in the image of God. Whatever that means, we could connect with God and the spirit, the Ruach of God, is not, as the Christians say, a separate person, a different member of the God. 
The Spirit of God means the movement of God that we can understand and we can embrace. It's not separate from God. It is God as we can connect to Him. Okay, So it is in Tanakh, but it's not separate. It's not a separate person in the Godhead as Christians would have you believe. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I believe Christians understand the word spirit in the Bereshit and they uh, compare it with the Greek language. They compare the spirit with the Penuma Hygion, right, Rabbi? Okay. But right. actually, I believe it's not the same. What do you say, Rabbi? I agree. Your viewers must be very careful, very careful with this. Christians and Jews and Muslims, we're all using the same word, but we mean something different. Muslims and Jews mean the same, generally mean the same thing by the same word. Not always, but in this case, it's very important. But Christians are using the same word that we find Tanakh. That means we're using the same word. However, what Christians mean by that word is something violently different than what Jews mean or what Muslims would mean. In Christianity, the Holy Spirit is a separate person in a three-part God. I mean, all yes. Christians, if you ask a Christian, how many gods do you believe in? So every Christian mm -hmm. will say, I believe in only one God. But there's one God in three persons. You notice this word person doesn't mean what we normally mean in English. If I say there are, I see one person here, I see another person here, and there's another person there, how many people do I see? I see three people. See, that's conventional. But what the church does is they use this strange language in order to cover, in order to mask what's really happening. And as there really are three powers. And therefore, it is true that Christians and Jews are both using the term ruach, as you said in Greek, pneuma. It doesn't make a difference. But we mean something very different fundamentally. So you have to be very careful about not just what word we use, but what is meant, what is conveyed by that word. Yes, thank you very much, Rabbi, for your explanation. Actually, I'm very relieved to hear this from you, Rabbi. I'm, I'm glad that you'll let me stay on the show. I'm kidding. Okay, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> I miss oh. Indonesia a lot. I miss it. I miss you. You must come again, Rabbi, please. Inshallah. Many people miss you here. Uh, they should. No, I'm kidding. I, I, I miss it very much. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I, I just finished the translation of your video when you're having the how to say the social activity. You are giving the food for the poor in uh -huh. middle of Jakarta. Right. Yeah. Yes. It's yes. very nice. Yes. See, yeah. that was Muslims and Jews. Together, we would feed the poor in Jakarta. It was very special. Yes, correct. And uh, Rabbi, I, I often hear you say that uh, Muslims are the cousins of the Jews. Can you explain a little bit about this? I, I use that term because... Um, so, because the... Because... Islam traces itself back, of course, to Adam. But an Islam is not a race. Islam is a faith for everyone. But Islam certainly emerged out of a, an Arab crucible, out of an, the Arab world, out of Arabia, uh, from Muhammad, the prophet, very important prophet in Islam, who, according to Muslim tradition, was a descent of Yishmael. Right, and the Jewish people are descendants of Isaac and Jacob, also prophets in Islam, and therefore uh, we call it cousins because you have essentially the Bnei Yishmoel, and you have the Banu Yisrael. So therefore, they're cousins. That's why I use that term to convey that biblical message in the relationship. Okay, so that's mean. Do you believe that? Uh... Ismail is the ancestor of uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu No one really, look, I can't say anyone knows that, but it seems uh, the tradition in Islam is 
that he was. It's not in the Quran. There's nowhere in the Quran that we have the genealogy of Muhammad. So it's Muslim tradition, Islamic tradition, that um, that Muhammad was a, a descent of Yishmael, who was a brother of Isaac. Okay. Uh, thank you, Rabbi. And uh, next, if you... If you, uh, we heard your explanation about this, uh, it's only in the beginning, but can you say that uh, Christianity as one of the Abrahamic faith? Well, yes, that's why Christianity has a problem. That's why we are reaching out to Christians, because it believes that Abraham was a true servant of God. And therefore, we want to help Christians who unfortunately believe in the doctrine of the Trinity, an idea and a word that's not found anywhere in the Bible, nowhere. Mm. And we, therefore, my heart goes out to Christians because they consider themselves a part of the Abrahamic faith and because their religion came from the Abrahamic faith emerged from Judaism. So therefore, I have a special desire uh, to reach Christians that they should worship the true God and worship the way Abraham worshiped. Abraham, a blessed memory, all of Hashem, he did not believe in the Trinity. He knew there was only one God and no other, as Isaac, as Jacob, as all the prophets. And therefore, we encourage, we want, we call upon Christians, we invite Christians to worship one God alone and not a trinity, not worship any prophet, not worship any man, not worship any spirit, only the one true God. That's why we care about Christians so much. And that's why Christians can be reached so easily with this message, because they consider themselves a part of the Abrahamic tradition and regard the Hebrew Bible as the word of God. <laughs> Right by one time I saw your video, you mentioned that uh, Abraham would have cried rolling on the floor when he saw the churches with the Trinity doctrine. <laughs> you remember that? Of course. <laughs> of course. He would he would imagine how Abraham would feel to yeah. know that there are people who considered him a prophet and worship the man as God. Imagine mm -hmm. the pain he would feel. I mean, yeah. he cried out that the world should repent. He begged God for those who were sinners in Sodom. He was such a great man. I, I can't wait for the coming of the Messiah and the resurrection of the dead so that I could see Abraham with my eyes. I, I think about that often, and I hope that I'll merit to see him in the resurrection. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, that this doctrine of the Trinity was exactly against the teachings of the prophets of blessed memory, not just Abraham, but all the prophets. Okay, but uh, you, you, you mentioned earlier that Christianity worshiped Jesus as God. Mm. That's why you call them as a uh, avoda zara, right? The, right? the alien worshippers. Right. Uh, in in English, can we say this is the idolatry? Yes, that's the exact word that should be used. Okay. <laughs> okay. So that means can we call the Christianity as a pagan? Yes, of course. Okay. Thank you very it, much. It's not just pagan; it's the worst kind of paganism. It's oh. worse. It's worse than Hinduism. It's worse than worshiping Baal. The reason why Christianity is worse than Hinduism is that they worship the true God. Christians believe that the God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, is God. But in addition to that, they believe that he has a son. See? So this that's called that's the shirk. So therefore it, the the type of worship that Christians engage in is the worst type of paganism. Now the word pagan is just an old word that means people who lived outside of the city. But we mm -hmm. can use whatever word, but it's it's idolatry. That's the key point. It's okay. ungodly. Okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs> that 
that is the most important thing I want to hear from you tonight, by the way. Sure. Okay. Uh, and then Christianity using your Torah as the uh, Old Testament, which they uh, which they adopt from the Septuagint, yeah, Rabbi. And they say that Jesus was prophesied in the Old Testament. So, in general, I would like to hear your comment about this. Yeah. So this is uh, this is a, a terrible tragedy. Um, Christians are have a big problem, and that is the Christian Bible says that Jesus prophesies in the Jewish Bible. In Luke twenty four forty four, specifically says that you know Jesus prophesies in the Torah, the prophets, and Psalms, which is the writings. Right. Um, it's all it's all over the Christian Bible. But in fact, there is no prophecy in the Jewish Bible about Jesus, none. And worse, what the church then did was it changed the words, the, the words of the Bible in the translation. See, the problem is that almost no Christian could read a Bible in Hebrew. Even though Christians believe that the Hebrew Bible is holy, no Christian reads Hebrew in Indonesia. Indonesia must have, I don't know, 35 million Christians? I don't know. None of them read Hebrew, right? They read in Indonesian, They, but they're not reading it. They may read in English, maybe, but none of them are reading it in Hebrew. This means that those who translate the Bible into Bahasa, into Indonesian, what they do is they can change the words, and that's what the church did. And because Christians can't read Hebrew, they have to depend on a corrupt translation. And that's why these Christians mean well. Many of them are very sincere, and they don't know why you are a Muslim. You should become a Christian. Look at the Bible. Why, do, why doesn't Rabbi Singer believe in Christianity. Look, they don't understand that their Bibles, their Christian Bibles, have been changed in the translation. They have no access to the original. You know, I, I remember when I lived in Indonesia, I mm. remember, especially during Ramadan, Christ, uh, Muslim boys, Muslim children would recite the whole Quran by heart in Arabic, by heart. Yes. It was on television. And you could yeah. see them, they knew the whole Quran in Arabic. Look, every Muslim, I have so many Muslim friends in Indonesia, every one of them has an Arabic Quran in their home. Now, it's true that some Muslims should study Arabic more, and some do and some don't. It's true. But every Muslim that I know has a Quran in his house has one in Arabic, also with a translation in Indonesian. Why? Because Muslims cherish the original language of the Quran. It's just so simple. Again, it's not to say that every Muslim in the world it mm -hmm. could, uh, could read Arabic or speak Arabic. And it is also true that Muslim leaders, Muslim imams, Muslim educators want Muslims to study the original language more, of course. Some do, some don't. But Muslims want, the best thing is to read the Quran in the original language. That will be the best thing. Every Muslim will tell you that. Same thing for Jews. We study the Tanakh in its original language. We read Hebrew fluently. That's our original language. And therefore, we don't rely on translators. We might have them we for you know people who don't read hebrew but every religious jewish child learns hebrew immediately and that was very exciting you know just studying hebrew as a kid and reading the bible in the original language the church because their christians don't read hebrew they're in a lot of trouble mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yes uh what you say are all correct uh rabbi but i i saw one uh Indonesian Bible with Bahasa Indonesia and also with the Hebrew language also, Rabbi. I saw one version of the Indonesian Bible. Right, but do in it do the Christians living in Papua, do mm -hmm. the Christians 
living in Java, living on the island of Java, living in Jakarta. There are many, many Christians. How many in Jakarta? Jakarta is such a big city. It's one of the yeah. largest cities in the world. Okay. You know how many mm -hmm. Christians live in Jakarta? And then you go beyond into the outskirts. You know how many Christians are there in the greater Jakarta area? Millions. How many of them could read Hebrew and understand Hebrew? Yeah. Maybe I don't three. Think... Maybe three. And why yeah. do they and their professors at the university? That yes. means the only people in Indonesia that are fluent in Hebrew, with very rare exceptions. I yes. know Muslims in Indonesia who study Hebrew. I do. <laughs> uh, but the truth is that, you know, you have a, 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 you know, Jakarta. It's a huge city of tens of millions of people. I don't even know how many people live there. And there are yeah. many, many Christians in Jakarta. Many. None of them speak Hebrew. None of them can read the Bible. I don't Hebrew. think so. <laughs> no, of course not. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Rabbi, uh, can you tell us a bit about the similarity, similarities of uh, Judaism and Islam in terms of the, the law, I mean, the, in the Sharia? What's important to understand is that to both Jews and Muslims, our faith not only guides what we believe, but how we live our lives. For the Jew, every aspect of our lives is guided by the Torah. Everything. From the moment we wake up in the morning until we go to sleep, every part of our day is guided by Jewish law. In Hebrew, Jewish Sharia is, means uh, Islamic law. And interesting, the, where does that word come from, Sharia? So the word Sharia doesn't really mean law. It means a path. It means the straight path. It's actually the same word in Hebrew. It's a path. So mm -hmm. Sharia means the proper straight path. And that word has come to be understood to mean Islamic law. In Hebrew, the same word is used, but it's called halakha. Halakha uh -huh. refers to all Jewish law. You know mm -hmm. what the word halakha means in Hebrew? Yeah. It means the straight path. It's the same oh. thing. Exactly the same thing. The straight path. It doesn't mean just um, we believe this and believe that, but does your behavior uh, reflect your faith? So therefore, the similarities of Judaism and Christianity is, number one, what we believe. One God and no other. Number two, God is merciful. No Jew ever says, I know that God will save me, as many Christians proudly say. No Jew would ever say this. It's arrogant. No Muslim will ever say such a thing. I'm sure that I'm going to heaven. No one would say that. Mm -hmm. We say, like I get on a plane, right? I don't say, I'm sure this plane is going to land. I say, with God's help, this plane will land, land safely. We, we don't arrogantly say, I know we know that we serve Hashem with great love and worship, and we believe that God is filled with mercy. He's a Rachman. Rachman mm -hmm. is a name of God, both in Arabic and in Hebrew. It's the same word. It means mm -hmm. merciful. So we trust that God is merciful, and that if we repent of our sins, that God will forgive us. See, mm -hmm. so this is very important in Christianity. You can't, you can't repent, and God will just forgive you. You need to have a human sacrifice that died for your sins, which is very, very strange. Avoda zara. So, the the key is a way of life. I worship one God, no other, and to mm -hmm. know that we depend on God's mercy and love for forgiveness. Not yeah. some innocent person dying in Papua for our sins. That's silly. So that yeah. was very similar. Yeah. So I'd like to confirm to you, Rabbi. So in Tana or in Judaism, there is not a single prophecy for Jesus in the New Testament. Is that? Can you confirm the, that? Okay. No. No. All the it's it's really much worse. My brother, listen, it's not only that there is no prophecy about the Jesus of Christianity. 
that would be one thing. But mm. as it turns out in Tanakh, there are many prophecies that tell us don't do what Christianity says we should do. That means mm -hmm. that the the teachings about Jesus in Christianity, are, the prophets warned about this as something, a very grave sin, a very serious sin. So it's worse than that. And the church, as I mentioned, changes the Hebrew Bible, changes what it says in the original text, so that it looks like it's speaking about uh, Christianity. That's a very grave problem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, because many, many verses in the Old Testament are claims by the Christianity that that verses uh, is a prophecy, a prophecy for Jesus in the New Testament. In fact, I understand that almost 1,000 verses in the New Testament were quoted from the Old Testament. So I would say, or I would ask, is the writer or the author of the New Testament having the inspiration from the holy spirit or the having or having the inspiration from the old testament that what i can ask to them rabbi because so many verses in the old in, in the new testament were all quoted in the uh, from the old testament what do you say about that rabbi so i the christian bible quotes the hebrew bible many times yeah. the problem is that in many of these occasions, it's not quoting what it actually says. It yes. changes what it originally says. Now, it's true that, you know, the, the Christian Bible will quote the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is a God, the Lord is one. Yes. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and might. Deuteronomy chapter 6. That's in the Christian Bible. Yes. But the problem is that all the Christologies that are in the Christian Bible mm -hmm. are quotes from a corrupt text, not from the original text. Mm. And those corruptions are buried into the Septuagint, have been placed mm. in the Septuagint by the church. Now, you if you're a Christian listening to me, you've been told by your priest, by your pastor, that the writers of the New Testament were quoting the Septuagint. Mm. Believe me, you're going to be told that. And I want to, for just a moment, I want to talk to the Christians. I don't want to speak to the Muslims for a moment. I don't want to speak to the Jews. I just want to tell the Christians of this. You are going to be told by your leaders, by your religious leaders, that the Christian Bible, the writers of the Christian Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, and so on, were quoting from a Greek translation of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And it's not that your pastor is lying to you. This is what your pastor was taught. This is what your priest was taught. But in fact, it's completely not true. Mm -hmm. The original uh, translation of the, was of the Septuagint was only the five books of Moses. And what the church did was it created a Greek translation. Origen is very responsible. He's a third century church father to conform to the corruptions that we find in the Christian Bible. So you have to be very aware of this, and I'm saying this to the Christians. When someone says to you, ah, but it's in the Septuagint, some Greek translation, listen to me. Again, I'm talking to the Christians. If you're a Muslim, listen in, but this is not to you. To the Jews, you can listen, but I'm saying, in what universe, in what, how is it possible that a translation could, could be superior to, an, to the original? In mm -hmm. what universe, in what world, if an original document is written in Indonesian, let's say you have a document, a contract written in Indonesian, yeah, then someone then translates that into Chinese. The Chinese mm -hmm. translation cannot be superior to the original Indonesian document because the original contract, the original document was written in Indonesian. Mm -hmm. and, and Chinese and Indonesian, I chose those two languages because Mandarin Chinese and Bahasa Indonesian are totally different languages, totally different. They have nothing to do with each other. You know, yeah. It's like Greek and Hebrew. They have two different wor worlds apart, like English and Arabic, different worlds. It's not close, it's not similar. They have nothing to do with each other. So I say to you, Christians, reconsider 
rethink this all. Don't let anyone tell you about Greek translations and English, nothing. Learn the Hebrew, go back to the original. I remember so many Indonesians in in Jakarta and other islands, Muslims, who would study with me and beg me to teach them Hebrew. There was a few people who I asked that they teach me Arabic, which is much harder. <laughs> and we I, would, yeah, we would trade. I, I would. There was there was a few people in in Jakarta who who knew Arabic, very fluent in Arabic, and mm -hmm. I wanted to learn Arabic. And because I speak Hebrew, so mm -hmm. Arabic is very close to Hebrew. It's it's, no, it's of the same family of languages, a Semitic yeah. language, many Semitic. many words. So I would want to learn Arabic. They would learn Hebrew. It's much easier for them than for me. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll tell you a funny thing. A funny thing. I'll just tell you this. I never told this to anybody. Oh, tell me, Rabbi. I'll tell you that I never said to anyone in my life. So there are many words in Indonesian that are actually from Hebrew because they're from Arabic. So Indonesian is a very different language than Arabic is, right? But because Indonesia is home to the largest Muslim community in the world, more Muslims live in Indonesia than any other country, so there are a lot okay. of Ar Arabic words that crept into the Indonesian language, right? Mm -hmm. There are many, right? So I, because I know Hebrew, so when I hear a word in, in Indonesian that's really in Hebrew, it's the same word, I know that that word is not a Javanese word, that word doesn't mm -hmm. come from Indonesian, but it actually traces itself back to Arabic, and Arabic is a very close relative of Hebrew. And there are mm -hmm. many, many words that are both in that are both in Arabic and in Hebrew that are the same, very many words. So therefore, similar construct, very close language. So when I was in Indonesia, when I would hear a word spoken in Indonesian that I recognized from Hebrew, I knew that mm -hmm. word traces itself back to Arabic, which is that which is inside the Indonesian language. Mm -hmm. Can you can you give me uh, some samples of the words? Sure, Rahman. Ah, Rahman. Ra what? How do you say a woman's womb is a rechem? Right? I see. What oh. does that? What does that mean? A womb? Why is the word rechem a womb where a baby mm -hmm. is comes to life? Why is the word rechem and mm -hmm. the word Rahman same mm -hmm. root? which means mercy. Why is a womb and mercy the same word? It's the mm -hmm. same thing in Arabic, Indonesian, in Hebrew, same word. Why? What's the relationship? Listen carefully. When we ask God for mercy, what are we asking for? Mm -hmm. Are we simply saying to God, I'm sorry, I feel bad, like you go, please let me have what I want? Is there something mm -hmm. deeper going on? Like, is God heaven forbid, like a, an old man who just says, okay, I'll give you what you want. There's mm -hmm. something more profound going on in mercy, in Rahman. What does it mean? When a baby is still inside his mother, mm -hmm. in her womb, in her yes. Rahman, he did not do anything good yet. He wasn't even born yet. He did nothing mm -hmm. good. But yet, God protects the baby in the womb, all the food the baby needs, all the protection, nice and warm, perfect temperature, everything's taken care of for the baby that's not born yet. Mm -hmm. Why would God provide for a baby something mm -hmm. it does not deserve? Mm -hmm. A baby didn't do anything good yet. The mm -hmm. baby in the mother's womb is not righteous. Why mm -hmm. is God giving this baby all this protection, mercy, uh, love, food, nutrition, everything's taken care of, mm -hmm. not because of what the baby did, but what the potential for the baby in the future? Mm -hmm. One day could become great. When we go to God and ask for mercy, what we're really saying is the following. We're saying mm -hmm. to God, don't judge me on what I did. I know I did the wrong thing. Would you judge me like a baby in the womb of my potential for the future? And that's what mercy is. Mercy is God saying that I believe in you. Mm -hmm. 
help you along and I'm going to forgive you, not because you necessarily deserve it, but because of what you can do in the future, just like a baby in the mother's womb. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. I just know that right away. But uh, I can tell you uh, many words from uh, Arabic language, roughly uh, at least about 1,500 words right by at least yeah so you are very correct that uh, indonesia has many arabic language in bahasa indonesia so uh, how many words in, in bahasa indonesia that you learn rabbi that i learned not a lot not a lot i knew enough when i was in a taxi uh -huh. that i could say Kiri, Kanon, right? Oh, Kiri, Kiri. kiri. Go left. Kiri means... Left, Kanon, go right. You right, know. yeah. I, you know, I knew what I needed to know um, just to get where I needed to go. My, In truth, everyone around me was um, speaking English. So mm -hmm. it wasn't like I needed to learn Indonesian. So I, you mm -hmm. know, I learned just what I needed. Apa kabar? How are you? That's right. Selamat pagi. Good morning. Yes. <laughs> you bring back many memories. <laughs> so I hope, I hope, I really hope that you can come again to Jakarta, Rabbi. I look forward to it. Okay. So you mentioned that you you uh, learn Arabic language in Indonesia, right? So let me explain that. That means there are Indonesians who wanted to teach me Arabic, and I would study. But in truth, I it was very difficult. It means, I, why did I want to study Arabic? Why? Kenapa? Kenapa. Uh, okay. okay. Very good. <laughs> okay. So why did I want to study Arabic? Because there are many commentaries on the Quran uh, the tafsir, mm -hmm. right? That I've never been translated into English. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, the, the largest area of Islamic literature, besides Sharia, is mm -hmm. the tafsir, the commentary on the Quran, mm -hmm. and most of it has never been translated into English. Mm, okay? I see. I mean, of course, the very famous tafsir, Imam Al Tabari, that's been yeah. translated. But yeah, the vast yeah. majority is not. And I wanted to be able to study it, to research. And mm -hmm. therefore, I wanted to learn Arabic so that I could study Islamic commentaries for myself mm -hmm. because there was no translation. So the problem was that the level I needed to study Arabic at was not simply to make out a few words or to read it. And I thought, and it's mm -hmm. true, because I speak Hebrew, so I have an mm -hmm. enormous advantage in learning Arabic because it's mm -hmm. it's not just any words are the same, but it's also the structure. This it's a consonantal language. You know, there's a the root system is essentially the same. It's mm -hmm. a very very similar languages. So if if you speak Hebrew, your Arabic is going to come much easier to you. So I thought, mm -hmm. you know what? Let me try to study Arabic so that I could read the tafsir. And understand, mm. which has never been translated. What I realized in time is I have only a limited amount of time that I, to the level I needed to learn Arabic to for what I wanted it for, that is to read the tafsir for myself, that it would just take too much time and I abandoned it. So, I see. <laughs> right. so, so I, do, you, do you miss your Arabic teacher, Rabbi? Yes, of course. Remember this? Hi. Oh, wow. Etika, how are you? She's the one. Hi, She's bye bye. Oh, thank you. Wassalam we, are... we are at the same team, you know. Wow, that's wonderful. We are at the same team, Rabbi. I, I gave him your email address so that you can have the people speech in in our country, you know. Mm. You know, mm. uh, when I saw your debate with, with Professor Solberg, it was amazing, you know. 
Thank you. It was but very... by the way, Rabbi, there is uh, there is a Islamic there is an Islamic university. Mm. Rafat Islamic University and it's a, a, a that that foundation has the biggest Islamic boarding school. They want you to give a speech on Judaism. Once I gave the speech there, then if if possible, then you can give a speech whether from online or if it is possible when you are in Indonesia, then they would be glad that it will be highly, highly appreciated if you can come there to give a speech on Judaism. Because I sometimes, I often uh, give uh, Judaism based on what I learned from you. You know, it has changed radically what I thought Judaism before I met you. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah. I miss yeah. you so much, Rabbi. I miss you too. And for you, the viewers, Etika is a very, very sm special and very smart person, very, very wise woman. And she began to teach me Arabic. but And she, incidentally, worked very hard, not too hard, but to learn Hebrew. And she's very good. You, Etika, are very, very smart. God bless you with a wonderful mind and a wonderful... Oh, yeah. And uh, yes, I look forward to coming back to Indonesia and studying again with uh, my dear friends. And, and I look forward to it, inshallah. Yeah. Thanks. So that Thank later I, I will contact you because that, 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 that the students of Islamic, uh, in the Islamic department, they study Islams and they really want to know about Judaism. But I give a speech, I give a speech on Judaism, but Maybe it would be better if you are the one who gave a speech. They really want you to give a speech there. I mean, they are open-minded now about the Judaism. As as I as I am now, before before I met you, I had a very misunderstanding on Judaism. You know what, what I thought is something which is not good. It, it was time which which was not good. But until I met you, I have changed completely. That Judaism is in fact. The same as Islam, it's it's Tawhid. Right. Okay, go bye on, bye. Rabbi. Oh, bye you. bye. Please come to Jakarta again. I will be the one who pick you up in the airport. Okay. Oh, so I don't have to take Bluebird. Uh, no, 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 no Bluebird. To. I'll take. I'll pick you up personally. No, no Bluebird. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, that's good. All right. All okay. Right. This is the one, the surprise that I meant to you earlier. Oh, thank you very much. That's wonderful. It's wonderful seeing you again. Uh, God should only bless you and strengthen you. Yeah, we. Okay. I've been learning uh, uh, Judaism from Rabbi. I, I forgot how many years since 2016 and before, until before you got, went back to Jerusalem, to Israel, mm -hmm. or to U.S. at that time. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I look you forward know. to it. Yeah, Rabbi, please go ahead. No, I, I look forward to coming back to Indonesia. Yeah, we will pick you up. We will pick you up. And if you need accommodation for several days, we will prepare the, the accommodation. Beautiful. Sounds wonderful. So how, 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 how's the synagogue? I mean, how's the, the apartment that we, uh, usually I come there for learning the Judaism? Is still how? there? I don't know. I didn't look. You told in, in oh, Jakarta. Have then, after that. I have no. I, I have no idea. All right. I have no idea. That's because in... Bu Elishafa, Bu Elishafa is now in in Israel, eh? in Jerusalem. The the what? I didn't. Bu Elishafa. Eli Elishafa. Yes, yes, she's doing Elie. well. She's married. She's doing beautiful. Yeah, I know. Wonderful, wonderful All family. Right. Yeah. All right. I'm glad to, to, to know that. Yeah, yeah, she's doing great. Robbie is a very, very kind person, you know, but don't he? He, <laughs> he even course. prepared me for, for my buka puasa, you know. Wow, <laughs> he really? Tried the salmon, salmon, what is it? The salmon. With the salmon fish? fish. For, for, yeah, yeah, for me, prepare for my first, during I learned my Hebrew with him. Man, you know, yeah, wow. he always prepare my buka puasa and serve me with very good food. And then Man, when yeah, we, <laughs> sometimes we, we went to restaurant, the sushi, what's the name? Sushi Tei. 
but Rabbi on this uh, order the vegetables. And uh, so Rabbi, you are a good cook. I'm very good cook. Yeah, very nice, you know. That is your food from Rabbi. Yes. Oke, okay, uh, Bu Etika, tadi kan saya lagi tanya jawab gitu ya sama Re, sama hmm. Rebuai gitu ya. Pertanyaan-pertanyaan itu kan yang memang kita sering uh, apa namanya kita sering ajukan kepada atau orang-orang Muslim di luar sana juga sering ajukan kepada Rebuai. So tadi banyak sudah kita kirim pertanyaan ke uh, Rabi Tobias Singer. Masya Allah jawabannya tadi semuanya mantap Bu jawabannya. Mantap, you know mantap Rabai. It's very satisfying. Your answer is very satisfying. That's mantap. Oh, wonderful. wonderful. Thank you. Thank okay, you. so uh, now I'm going to start to ask the questions from the audience, yeah, Rabai. Okay. Okay, so I will choose uh, some of the questions. Uh, one question from the the audience. Uh, the name is Si Kunchung. Yeah. The question is uh, roughly like this: Why Jews do not accept the Septuagint, and uh, when Septuagint officially become the Old Testament? Okay. Uh, why don't Jews accept the Septuagint? Because it's a corrupt translation. I mean. Who would want to accept a translation, especially one that's been corrupted? I mean, you know, if if you were married to your wife, would you want to live in separate rooms? Why wouldn't you want the original? Why wouldn't you want the the, the original Hebrew? So the, the Septuagint is corrupted. Originally, the Septuagint was translated by rabbis about 2,250 years ago about the year 250 BCE for the Alexandrian li Library. That library is destroyed and we lost that. But that was only the five books of Moses. That wasn't Isaiah, Jeremiah, and so on. And then people began to translate Tanakh into Greek, many, many translators. And then Christians began to translate Tanakh into Greek. And that's where the trouble is. So the Septuagint you have that you can buy on Amazon in a bookstore, that translation has been, is a product of the church. It's alien, it's corrupted. Mm -hmm. But no one, I mean, translation is not a good idea. You know, would, would you want, um, when you're speaking to someone that you love, that, that that person says to you something in Chinese and then someone else translates that into Spanish and then someone else translates that into Indonesian? I mean, why would you want that? Wouldn't you want to speak directly in the same language? Doesn't even make sense. Okay, as as far as I know, Rabbi, that the actually the final Septuagint, which is used for the Old Testament, was actually a correction Hesychius, Origen, and Lucian, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. That's yeah. right. But Origen is the major. His His hand is in the Septuagint more than anyone. Origen was the only church father, except Origen and Jerome. They're the only two church fathers that spoke Hebrew. They were completely mm -hmm. fluent Hebrew. That's it. So Origen has the greatest. So the, the Greek translations have been undergoing all changes and changes and changes. And Origen is the one whose influence is greatest on the Septuagint that you can go online would get in a bookstore today, right? Mm -hmm. Rabbi, do you remember this? Well, let me see. Let me look. I, I wasn't looking at the thing. Do I remember? Holy smokes, Menachem. How are you? Shalom, dear Rabbi. Nice God, to meet you. So All this moment. Shalom. For all. <laughs> Wow, wow, you, my dear brother. Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem. Thank you so much, Menachem. I miss you a lot. Uh, I also miss you. Exactly, I want to talk to you everything, especially about Judaism, because everyone, uh, Muslim people in Indonesia, really need about the information of Judaism. Exactly, this is very important for everyone. Hmm, yeah. Uh, 
I'm, I'm very shocked to see Etika and now Menachem. This is like a big present. And when I come to Indonesia, Menachem, I'm, you're going to get a very big hug. And just so you know, the viewers know that Menachem is a real scholar. He really is. And studies Hebrew very, very well. He's very, very smart. I mean, you brought on two very bright people. Menachem Ali is just brilliant in Hebrew. He really <laughs> studies very hard. And uh, and he's a very dear friend to me, uh, as Etika, very dear. So this is very exciting. So it's wonderful to see you, Menachem. And I hope to see you um, in Indonesia sometime soon. I look forward to that. Yeah, Rabbi. So you like my surprise tonight, Rabbi? What's that? You like the surprises tonight? I love that. Keep them going. <laughs> Go Rabbi, that, that is, uh, there is maybe one or two Christian figures that that, that they, they know Hebrew. They, they know Hebrew. They understand Hebrew. But the problem is they, they don't know Judaism. Maybe only one or two. They, they know Hebrew, but they do not know Judaism. You see? That's, right. so, I know that she, she, um, he or she, she understand Hebrew, but the problem is understanding Hebrew does not mean understanding Judaism, you know, so, because let me, let me explain. Let me, let me explain what's going on. So you have a person who's born into a Christian family, right, and goes to school, and then in college, that's when people could study Hebrew. So you can. You can go to the University of Indonesia and study Hebrew. You can get a PhD in Hebrew, right? You can. You can really do that. But think about at what stage of life is a Christian learning Hebrew? 20 years old, 22 years old, going to university. And by that point, they have already, they're already Christians, so they're reading but the text just right back in. It, they're already committed. They're not making a decision anymore. And that's the danger. That means Christians are not raised in Hebrew. Rather, if a Christian has an opportunity to learn any Hebrew at all, they're doing it at the you know as an adult. And at that point, they've already committed themselves to the Christian religion, and it's not easy for them to read through it. And also. Most of them are not studying it critically. You know, they're not really, look, they're not really reading through the book of Isaiah. They're not really reading through all 66 chapters of Isaiah in Hebrew. That's not what's really going on. So it's true there are Christians who could study Hebrew. Of course, you could take it at the university in, in, in Indonesia and in many, many universities. But most of them, you know, could barely read it. And if they can, they already are committed to Christianity. It's not easy for them. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Rabbi, I will give you some time with uh, uh, Mr. Menahem Ali. Maybe uh, Mr. Menahem Ali has some issues to discuss with you. Pak Ali, silakan, Pak. Okay. Uh, today, we have to understand about Judaism, especially from the primary sources. And we know that Rabbi... Tobia Singer is a representative, really great man for us to teach about the Judaism in the perspective from the source. And uh, if you are talking about, about Judaism, we have to know that the basic fate of Judaism is monotheism. It is a similar aspect uh, in Islam. And the second about the halakha and Rabbi Tovia Singer explained to us that halakha is something like Sharia in Islam. And so that's why we have to follow the halakha as the part, the right part of God to us for the humankind. So that why we cannot follow God without following about the halakha or Sharia. And many aspects of halakha and Sharia in the perspective of Islam, uh, really important to be understood by Muslim and Judaism. And the big problem for Muslim in Indonesia, they don't know about Hebrew itself. And it is not only, the, they don't know about the language, the sacred language of God. They also don't, they don't know about Judaism from the primary sources. So that's why, uh, 
Roberto Via Singer, as I said before to everyone, it is a good person to teach us about the Judaism itself. And it is not the shadow of Christianity, but from the Judaism itself. So, uh, for example, if we know, if we want to know about the history of Abraham, we have to reflect about the story of Abraham in the Quran. And this story has a link with the literature of Judaism from the Talmud, for example, and from the Midras and from the Tanakh itself. So everyone in Indonesia have to classify between the apostolic Bible and the rabbinic rabbinic bible because rabbinic bible is so different with the apostolic bible from this from this perspective maybe uh rabbi tovia singer can explain to audience in indonesia what is the difference between between uh, two uh, bible in the context of the academic perspective okay you're asking me to explain what's the difference between a Christian Bible and a Jewish Bible? Yes. Maybe Rabbi Tavia Singer sure. can explain about the Apostolic Bible and the Rabbinic Bible. What is the difference between both aspects? When you say apostolic, do you mean, what do you mean by that? You mean... The, the Septuagint. Be, oh, because okay. There's a very, very a problem, big problem for the Indonesian people. Okay. All right. So when you say apostolic, you're using it in a yes. sense of referring to the Septuagint. Yes. All right. So going back, as I mentioned, some 2,250 years ago, that's a really long time. That's the middle of the Second Temple period. The Hebrew Bible, the five books of Moses. Now, there are in the Hebrew Bible really 39 books. Truthfully, there are really 24 books, like First and Second Samuel is really one book. First and Second Kings is really one book. But the of the Hebrew, the first part is the five books of Moses. This is given to us uh, by God through his prophet Moses. Uh, so that alone was translated into the Greek translation. And for the Alexandrian library, that translation has been lost. Most Christians think, in fact, all Christians think, if you ask them, they would tell you that the Septuagint is a translation of the entire Old Testament. We don't say that, but the entire Tanakh. But it's not correct. It's only of the five books of Moses. But later, as the, the, the Greek empire expanded and the Greek language became like what English is in the world today, it's sort of a, the dominant language, people began translating Tanakh, all of Tanakh, into the Greek language, and Christians began doing that. And when they when they translated the Tanakh, they weren't translating what it says in the Hebrew, but what it says in the Christian Bible. So it was completely corrupted. So when when the when Paul corrupted the Hebrew Bible, the Septuagint goes with that. When uh, the Luke corrupted the Hebrew Bible, the Septuagint would reflect that. When the book of Hebrews corrupted the Jewish Bible, so all the corruptions found in the he book of Hebrews, so the book of Hebrews is part of the Christian Bible, and the book of Hebrews massacred the Jewish scriptures, changed it. Terrible. It has such a nice name. It's called Hebrews. But it's really the great enemy of Judaism because it's, it's not written by Paul, but it's Pauline. And I want to say this to you. On the day of judgment, you don't want to be anywhere near Paul. And I'll say this also. I've never said this before. But Muslims have even more of a reason to hate Paul than Jews. Because from a Muslim view, Paul has really destroyed everything that Jesus did. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. I hope you understand that. Yeah. It's very Paul, if if you I, I say this to Muslims, I'm not talking to Jews or Christians. If you as a Muslim don't detest Paul, there's something wrong with you. Because Paul really corrupted everything. 
He changed everything. Vicarious atonement. It's Paul's letters are the oldest books in the entire Christian Bible. So, and and now the book of Hebrews, we don't know who wrote it. Whoever wrote it does not put his name in it. It's not written by Paul, but it is Pauline. It's, it is a book that was very influenced by Paul's thinking, uh, a very disturbed, corrupted view of, of God, Judaism, and God's plan for salvation. And Hebrews routinely changes what it says in the text, and the Septuagint supports the book of Hebrews instead of what it actually says in the original Tanakh. And this is a problem. This is dangerous. So, yeah, it's a very big difference. Ya, Pak Ali, mungkin mau discuss Beresit 18, 1 atau 2 gitu, Pak? Oh, ya. Yeah. <laughs> exactly <Hello>. right. <laughs> uh, Rabbi, I have a question for, for, for you. Um, many people in Indonesia really know about the Bible. But they can, they can not to understand about the rabbinic Bible. That is a big problem, as you said before. Uh, when we are when we are reading about the Bible, especially when we read about the Sefer Bereshit, Sefer Bereshit, uh, chapter uh, uh, eighteen, yeah. verse two, there is two, uh, there is three men came to Abraham. According to the perspective of Christianity, they claim that God come to Abraham and meet to Abraham to give a good trading for, for him. And according to uh, the Judaism, especially to the perspective of Judaism, uh, I think it is not the, the confirmation about the coming of God to Abraham based on three person as the trinity exactly uh, so that's why we have to learn directly from rabbi because if muslim uh, uh, explain about this perspective they, 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 they don't know and they don't want to know but uh, it is uh, the other idea uh, if rabbi can explain to us it is very important for the audience today yeah, I, I want to explain this because as it turns out, thank you, Menachem. I, I love you, dear brother. It's very wonderful to hear us. So, so as it turns out, you don't even need a rabbi for this. <laughs> and when you asked me earlier about a Christian who can maybe study Hebrew, this is where you get into trouble. It actually says it in the text. There are three angels. So the text in Genesis, you're right, chapter 18, verse 2, it says, Shloisha Anoshim, which means three men. I mean, three beings. Yes. Now, each angel had a separate job. One was to inform, a why three? One was to inform Abraham that next year he'll have a baby. Big, big, very important message. The other two angels were sent to Sodom. One to rescue Lot. The other to destroy Sodom. Okay. And you don't even need a rabbi for this, because if you go to the next chapter, this is what people don't do, and you go to Genesis chapter 19, verse 1. You can use any Bible you want to. Use an Indonesian Bible, English, doesn't make a difference. What you're going to read in Genesis chapter 19, verse 1 is what? And two angels, literally it says angels. So therefore, it's actually in the text. This is what's mind-blowing. It actually tells us the very next chapter that these are angels. So, like, you don't even need a translation. If you go to a, a, an Indonesian Bible right now, go to Genesis 19, verse 1. So what's happened is Sodom, very wicked city, is about to be destroyed. And two of the three that came go to Sodom. So what is it? How does Genesis chapter nineteen verse one begin? Vayavo shnei hamalachim sedema, and two of the malach. What's a malach in Hebrew? Same as Arabic, angels. So messengers. Malachim. Malachim. Right there it is. So something, something new. 
and right. Uh, so you don't you don't need rabbis for this. It's right uh, in the text. And this, you know, Menachem helps us understand how people get in trouble, because people read one or two wor- verses by itself, and they don't read the context. They, I don't know why. It's like such a beautiful book. It's the Word of God. And like people just read Genesis 18, verse 1 and 2 and 3. That's it. Like, why don't you keep reading through 19? Moreover, Genesis 18 and 19 are together. Because in Genesis 18, God already is turning to Abraham and saying this, the, that Sodom is going to be destroyed. So the story begins in chapter 18. Chapter 18 and 19 are completely connected. It's the same story, event, that is being conveyed. And it continues in 19. It's not like something different happens. Like in chapter 20, there's a big change. But 19 and 18, so this is why people get into trouble. They read 18, they read three verses, and they go, ah, three persons came to Abraham. (gasps) Ah, the Trinity. And and they go, they they can lose God. Just keep reading. Angels are right in the next uh, next chapter. So it's right there in the text. It's really most of the questions that people have. It's just because they're reading a verse by itself and they don't read the whole book. I don't know why. You know, people read other books. They'll read it beginning to end. But when it comes to the Bible, for some reason, people just read two or three verses and they stop and they go, ah, and then they get into a lot of trouble. Yeah. Right, boy. How about the Genesis 1, verse 26? That uh, right. when we when what when God mean? says we are creating the man as our image, who right. is we in this verse? Can you please, Rabbi? Sure. How is man created? Totally different than all other creatures. Man is created with two things. God took the clay of the earth and formed it. And then this is Genesis chapter 2. And then he breathed into man his spirit. Every human being has a, a divine spirit, a holy... That means Men are not divine, but we have a nishama, a soul. The word nishama, you can, you can hear that word. So when God creates man, it's totally different than when God created monkeys, God created dogs, God created elephants. Why? Because an elephant, a dog, a cat, does not have a soul from God. It's only the clay of the earth. So we have with animals in common our DNA because they too are created from the clay, but what they aren't, are they have no spirit from God. And therefore, when God comes to man, unlike any of the other creatures, fish, animals, land animals, God says, let us, because who is God calling into that creation? Two things combined, the clay of the earth, that's the materialism, and the spirit of God. God breathed into Adam his spirit. Now, there's no other creature like it. And that's why, you know, if if people want to say, let us make man in our image, is Jesus, then why doesn't it say, let us make fish? Why doesn't it say, let us make animals? Let us make stars? That means this is the sixth day Adam is created on the sixth day, right? So in the beginning of the sixth day, animals, regular animals were created, right? Uh, fish are created earlier. All these other creatures are created earlier. The, the stars, the moon, were created on the fourth day, right? The fourth day of creation. So why didn't it say, let us make the the stars and the moon? Like, if, if see, the point of Christians are claiming is that Jesus is part of creation, based on Paul and based on Joannian theology, that through him everything was created. Okay, well, then why is Jesus just involved in creating man? That doesn't make even make sense. So what we have in view here is that God is summoning both the material, what what all beasts are made out of, and the spiritual, which only angels are made out of, combining together and saying, let us make men in our image. And then the next verse says, and God created him in his image. And that comes into view in chapter 2. And what's very interesting is, that this kind of God speaking in us 
only comes up right here. It comes up here in Genesis chapter 126, and God is speaking to, you know, angels are just spirit. They're just spirit. And the and the God says to the angels, when man has sinned and man has to leave the Garden of Eden, in Genesis 3.22, God says, you know, that you have to stand in front of the Garden of Eden and make sure that no one ever eats from the tree of life, lest he become like one of us. Same word. And then in Genesis chapter 11, verse 7, where you have uh, the people who built a great tower of Babel, to be equal with God or to reach the heavens in rebellion against God and to make for themselves a name for God, God says to the angels, let us go down to confound man. Why the three? Because God is speaking to angels and all of them. The point of saying us is to say that man is not God. That's the whole point. That man may try to be arrogant and be like God, but he cannot. So that's why he's using the word us. Man is alone in the world. You may love your dog. You may love your cat but they don't have a soul. They're not, God didn't breathe anything into them. Only man is a combination of the two, and that's brought into view in Genesis 1.26. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Rabbi. Pak Ali, ada lagi, Pak? Ya, yeah. yeah, saya kira itu penting tadi ayatnya diungkap oleh yeah. Rabbi, supaya orang Indonesia paham dari perspektif... Speak English, Pak. Speak English, Pak. Yehudi. Oh, ya. Yeah. Uh, as Rabbi explained to us that uh, Neshama, according to the perspective of the Bible, is very important to be understood by in, um, Indonesian Muslim. Uh, it is very important to, to know about the perspective itself. Uh, so that's why what, what is the meaning we, according to uh, the perspective of Hebrew Bible or Hebrew language, Anahnu and also similar in Arabic, nahnu, nahnu. Uh, uh, in Arabic, this is a uh, majestic plurality, means majestic plurality. It is not uh, oh, reflect, okay. to, reflect to the Trinity itself, but litta'adhim according to the Arabic uh, perspective. And uh, oh, okay. I explain to us as we know that. Hmm. Very powerful, yeah. Uh, uh, I, 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 I exactly want to know how we have a method for if we want to know about the uh, about the study of Judaism, especially for Indonesian people, because they don't have uh, primary sources to understand about Midras, for example. And they have, they don't have about the uh, Jewish literatures, and how we, how we can to study, uh, from the perspective of rabbinic, uh, rab, rab, from the rabbinic perspective, uh, because we know we we really want to know exactly teaching of Judaism itself. But Menachem, I I I don't know of anybody who can better answer that question than you. Meaning, here you are, a, an Indonesian Muslim who decided to committed himself to learning Hebrew and studying, and studying Midrashim, studying the rabbinic literature, and you've done that, I'm very, very proud of you. So you are a better example of that than me, right? And I think that you can best convey to your Muslim audience, to your um, Arabic and Indonesian-speaking audience about the about rabbinic teachings, and because you've you have engaged that so well. So I think you are much more qualified to answer that question than I am. All right, maybe uh, Boetika, you have something to ask, Rabbi. Yeah, maybe they can learn from the the Noahide channel, Noahide, Noahide channel by ba ba Leo. I think for Indonesian, I, th I think that's a good source also from Pak Leo because it under your foundation, right, oh. Rabbi? 
Uh, and then I think the problem when when I saw your debate with Professor Solberg, Solberg, Professor Solberg, yeah, Solberg yeah. Uh, on the 17th of July, do you remember that? Mm -hmm. uh, I think the the problem is the same. You know, even in the level of professor, when they under when when he understands uh, Tanakh in terms in a in a in, in uh, from the translation, that the problem is the same. He still thinks that. That Isaiah, Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 53 is about Jesus and other verses that he thinks it is a, a prophecy of Jesus, prophecies of Jesus. Because that's why, even in the level of professor, so, so sometimes I'm wondering why he is a professor, but he still regards the Isaiah 53 as a, as a prophecy of Jesus. I mean, he just takes one of first, one first out of context, you know. That's, mm. I think the problem of the Christians are the same as you mentioned, even in the level of professors, not just in the, in the common people, you know, and the common, um, I mean, it's ordinary Christians. Am I right, uh, Rabbi? Let me just say this. I don't want to speak about him personally. I just want to say, in general, Christians are not studying Isaiah in context. They memorize a few verses. This is not just true of professors, it's true of all of them. They simply are memorizing a few verses. When I ask Christians, what does it say in Isaiah 52? Isaiah 51, Isaiah 50, Isaiah 54, they have no idea. They have to look inside. So there is a dramatic danger if someone is memorizing certain verses and ignoring everything else. Menachem Ali uh, raised the question about that Christians asked about Genesis chapter 18, verse 2, right? What did I do? All I did was said, let's go to Genesis chapter 19, verse 1, right? We see clearly that these are angels. It's clear. It says it explicitly in all the Christian Bible. So I say this, I, I care about Christians. I want them to repent. I call upon them to come back to the true Abrahamic faith, to the true God. But not because I say so, not because I'm so persuasive, but because the God of Israel calls them. And I hope that they will look at the text. But there's not overwhelming, most of what I say is right there in the plain text. It doesn't require. So this is a problem with Christians in general. They're reading verses completely detached from the context. That's what's happening. They're memorizing a certain verse in Jeremiah. They don't read the verse before, the verse after, the whole chapter. And how many, how many Christians do you know have read the book of Jeremiah, all 52 chapters? Very few. Very rare. People are memorizing these certain verses and ignoring everything else. You know how much trouble you'll get into? It doesn't make a difference if you teach in university you don't. So um, I, I thank you for your thoughts, and I thank you for sharing that. that that's the key. Read it in context. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Truly, truly, uh, Rabbi. Rabbi, can you please uh, collaborate with us and explain about the true meaning of Ehad? Because most Christians also say they worship one God, they worship the true God, but they twist the meaning of Ehad become the unity of three persons. Can you? Yeah, so this is, um, hmm. um, so this is a, a, a great tragedy. So the word, the central theme of what a Jew says is, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. There, hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. There is one, there is no other. The Hebrew Bible says repeatedly that there is no one before me, there is no one after me. There is no other gods besides me. There is Ein Od Milvadai, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 35. There is no one else. So what what do Christians do? They, they want to keep believing in the Trinity, but how do you do that when the Torah says there is only one God, there is no other? There is Ephes Kamoni, Isaiah 46, verse 9. There is nothing like me, the Bible says. So what do they do? So you take the word one in Hebrew. It means it's echad. How do you say the number one in Indonesian? How? 
satu. Great. So let's take that word in Indonesian. In English, any language in the world, if I say there's one God, so I mean there's one God. But I'll ask you a question. Can't I say that I have uh, one uh, dining room set? Can't I say in, in Indonesian? So it's one, but really a dining room set, a kitchen set, is made up of chairs and table and so on. Does that mean that the word in Indonesian one means many inside of one? Of course not. It's, it's a silly, foolish game. Do you follow what I'm saying? So yeah. what Christians will say is, look, it says in the Bible that a man should leave his, his, his father's house and cleave unto his wife, to his wife together, and they shall become one flesh. They should become one together, right? So they say, ah, you see, the one means really it's called a complex unity. That is one, yes, but it's complicated because it's a man and a woman. This is, unfortunately, this is very silly because in reality, the, when the Torah says on the mouth of one witness, you cannot put anyone to death, but on the, on the testimony of two or three witnesses, you can. So you need at least two witnesses in order to punish somebody, right? So it says, same thing, one witness. So Christians don't quote this. It's, it's, it's a whole game, see, that on the mouth of one witness, no one can be put to death, but on two or three, yes. So it's the same Hebrew word, echad. But Christians don't quote this. Now, why? Because Christians are a bunch of liars? No. Because Christians are crazy people? No. They're good people. Not all, but many of them are very good people. This is what their pastor tells them. This is what they're taught in Christian schools. And they just repeat over the same nonsense over and over again. In any language, I could say that I have one mother. That's it. That's it. I have one wife, one, just one. Or you could say these, all these things become one together. Of course you could say that. So you always look at the context. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is a God, the Lord is one, and you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and might, not the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say anything like that. The idea of a trinity is a much later development. And the church has a problem. How do you take the doctrine of the Trinity that was developed essentially in the second and third century and established as Christian orthodoxy in the fourth century at the Council of Nicaea, and then read that back, infuse that into the Hebrew Bible? Because every Christian would ask the question, well, why isn't there a doctrine of the Trinity in the Hebrew Bible? Like, why doesn't it say it anywhere? Like, why isn't it's not even in the Christian Bible? So Christians then have to go to the text and figure some way, scour the text, to find the Trinity in there. Of course, it's not there. So all they can do is let us make man. Really? So us is plural. It doesn't tell you how many. So what is preventing these verses from meaning there are five gods? What not 20 gods? Why not 100 gods? It means why only three? There's nothing about a triunity because the Trinity, was that word was invented by Tertullian, the idea is a product of the church, then Christians have to go back to the Hebrew Bible and find some way to read into text things that are just not there. That's why the Jews reject the doctrine of the Trinity, and so should every person. Great, Rabbi. Thank you so much. Uh, I believe you will have time until 10.50, right? Uh, sorry, yeah, no 10.50, 10.45, then I have to go to... Right. Okay, so in this last maybe 10 to 15 minutes, uh, Pali, maybe you have another question for Rabbi? Mungkin audience yang lebih penting untuk tanya ini, penting Pak Gundi. Yeah. Um, audience, maybe can ask to Rabbi, it's very important moment for us to, to, to today. Okay, uh, Rabbi, I have one, uh, some questions from the audience. How does one qualify to adhere to Judaism? This question is, uh, I mean, to, to, to acknowledge this, uh, somebody is uh, a follower of Judaism, 
is it based based on the mother of or father lineage? Ah, okay. Based so it's the mother. Only the mother could confer, could convey a Jewish identity. I, I need to explain one thing that will be maybe difficult for your for your viewers. So Judaism is very unique in that there are the Jewish people are a nation, the Banu Yisrael. We're actually a people. And we're also a faith, a religion. Islam is a religion only. It's a faith, but it's not a people. You follow? So there are people who actually can join Judaism by converting to Judaism or are Jewish because their mother's Jewish. But then there are people who believe in Judaism but don't actually go through a conversion, and they're B'nai Noach. They're the righteous among the nations who believe in one God and follow that one God and keep basically seven Noahide laws. So, uh, but Judaism is, if someone is Jewish because the mother is Jewish. Mm -hmm, I see. Yeah, but for to, to, to acknowledge the, the tribe, I believe it's from the father. Is it correct? That's correct. Right. That's correct. As it says in Numbers chapter one, it's really all over the chapter that it's uh, that a tribe is identified according to your family, according to your father's house. So only a father could tell you you're from the tribe of Levi. I'm from the tribe of Levi. I'm a great grandson of Aaron of blessed memory, Aharon. Um, uh, you're from the tribe of Judah. That means that your father has to be from the tribe of Judah. So it's only fathers convey the tribe, and the mother conveys that you're Jewish. That's correct. Okay, uh, Rabbi, I still have two or three questions. Can you we please have explain to us? What? Go ahead. Yeah. Can you please explain to us about the uh, Ishmael when uh, called uh, wild ass in the Genesis? What is the meaning of the wild ass in the, in the Torah? Right. So there are, are two names for a donkey in the Bible. And one conveys a domesticated donkey, and one conveys an animal that's able to be all over and engage and is in the wilderness. Like you have horses that are... Um, are domesticated and they have horses that just run freely and in the wild west of the United States. Um, we are told that the Banu Yishmoel are able to thrive and survive in a wilderness that others can't and that he will engage with his brothers and there will be uh, engagement of business, commerce and war. And this has been the history of the of the Bnei Yisrael uh, of of this region of the world. I mean, we have a tribe that's used. The term donkey is used. We have tribes that lion is used. These are all. We have a tribe Dan where a, a snake is used. It doesn't mean that the Bnei Yisrael are donkeys any more than people who are from the tribe of Dan are snakes. Doesn't mean that at all. It's feature of an animal. Let's think about a donkey for a moment. Let's think of a donkey and a horse. When you're in Indonesia, you see you see donkeys frequently, not in Jakarta, but sort of outside, right? Yes. People have donkeys. Why don't you see people in Indonesia riding a horse? Why do, why do they ride a donkey? Peasants in Indonesia ride donkeys but you know you will know i never saw an indonesian riding a horse maybe there is i didn't see it why kenapa the reason is very simple the difference between a horse and donkey they're both very powerful they can both carry a load but a donkey could live anywhere you don't have to have a house for the donkey a horse has to have its own house called a barn right a horse needs very good food you need to put a horse, you have to keep it, you have to clean the horse all the time. You have to take care of it. It becomes afraid. A horse is not a durable animal. It needs very special care. When it's raining outside, you can't leave the horse outside. But a donkey, on the other hand, is very cheap. A donkey could leave outside in the rain. It doesn't need a house. It doesn't. It could survive under the worst circumstances.
And that's what a donkey is in Bnei Yishmael. The Bnei Yishmael are a people of endurance. They're able to endure the harshest circumstances and thrive. A horse, on the other hand, cannot. A horse requires tremendous protection, special feed. You have to care for a horse. It's very expensive. No one, the only people who would have horses is for battle because he needs something very fast. A horse can run faster than a donkey. But a horse can't survive. A donkey can. So the donkey, the wild donkey, is the creature that that could survive the worst circumstances that no one else can. That's what it means. Thank you so much, Rabbi. My pleasure. I, I heard about this for the first time. Because, you know, it is, most of them understand the wild donkey or wild ass in terms of the neg neg negative uh, perspective. It's like a people of war or something like that, Rabbi. Right. So, right. So the donkey, the critical part, I mean, look, Arabia, that's where Islam emerged from, right? That's where mm. the, you know, that was part of the Roman Empire. But the Roman Empire never bothered to go there and tries to seize what is today Saudi Arabia. Why? Because the soldiers would never survive there. No one can. I don't think you can. <laughs> You're not an Arab. So it requires a certain people that are completely durable, that can exp endure something that no one else could. So mm -hmm. this is what the meant by the donkey. This is why, my friends, I've been on many islands in Indonesia where you see on the side of the road a man on a donkey, mm -hmm. right? Or a donkey, he's pulling a donkey. You'll mm -hmm. not see a man pulling a horse, I don't think. Why? Because a donkey is cheap. A donkey you could do anything with. You could feed it anything. You could leave it out in the rain. doesn't make a difference. Donkey is durable. A horse is not. And, and that's the uniqueness of the Banu Yishmael. They have a covenant with God in the book of Genesis. And nothing could happen to undermine them. You know, think about the Bnei Yishmael for a moment. I, I want to close with this. That, you know, after Yishmael passed away, Ishmael passed away, there was a lot of idolatry among the descendants of Yishmael, all the way to the birth of Islam, there was Jehelia, an absence of knowledge, right? And yet God made a miracle. He mm -hmm. kept his promise. This is an amazing thing. The Jewish people had a continuous revelation with God, and there were always monotheists among the Jewish people. But in the, you know, we know that Mecca, you know, this Arabia was a place of idols before the Kaaba was restored, it was a place where there were hundreds and hundreds of idols there. People would bury their daughters under um, under a house. The people worshipped so many gods. But still, somehow, the Banu Yishmael, the children, the sense of Yishmael remained against all odds. This is an amazing thing. This is God's promise that he made to hug her when she was she had nothing. So of course people read it that way because they they have the they have the foolishness of a donkey. You have to have the mind, <laughs> a godly mind, not looking to be disrespectful. Okay, thank you so much, Rabbi. One last question, Rabbi, if you don't mind. Okay. This is the very last questions. What do you say for the people who say that Muslims worship the Kaaba or the Moon God? This is stupidity. These are people who are arrogant and are foolish and don't even take a moment to just ask Muslims, like, what do you worship? You know, I say this is arrogance because I have never been to Mecca. Right? Mecca is not a place for Jews. It's only Muslims go there, right? So I have many friends who are Muslims who have gone on Hajj, who have gone to pilgrimage, who have gone to Mecca. And I ask them, tell me what happens. Like, I ask Muslims who have gone on the pilgrimage, the sacred pilgrimage, that's a requirement of every able Muslim. And I just ask them, please tell me, what is this experience like? What is it like to go to the Kaaba? When you reach out to kiss the Kaaba, what are you doing? Like, are you worshiping the stones? So if you say it to a Muslim, they'll laugh you and think you're crazy and tell you you need a psychiatrist. I mean, so the reason I say it's arrogance when people say that Muslims worship the moon, I remember many years ago 
I was in Egypt many years ago. And I, I had the opportunity to scuba dive with a Muslim. Believe it or not, his name was um, uh, Muhammad Ali. I'm not kidding. If mm -hmm. he's watching this, I just saw him again not that long ago. So mm -hmm. many years ago, I don't know how many years ago it was, I asked him, there's a moon crescent above a mosque. Mm -hmm. Why is it there? Like, oh, that's all you need to do. Like, just ask a knowledgeable one. Now, there are some Muslims who don't study as much as other Muslims. Of course, we all Muslims want people to study as much as possible. So all you need to do, I say this to anyone who has a question, like, ask the Muslim. Like, if you really, if you really are curious about what a Muslim believes, ask him. The idea that Muslims worship the moon is complete nonsense. It's stupidity, utter stupidity. You know, in the Quran, one of the things that goes on in the Quran is something that there's one God, there's no other, there's no sun, there's no trinity, nothing. It's all over the Quran. It's almost to the point that people go, all right, I got it. Like, why does it have to say it so much? So, I mean, in the Quran, it's nonstop. There's one God, there's no other. So how could a person see that and then believe in this foolishness? How could a person do that? Now, it is true that Muslims re, uh, consider uh, Mecca to be a holy place. For Jews, Jerusalem is a very holy place. The holiest place for us is Jerusalem, right? And the wall that surrounds where the temple stood, the Harabayat, we, we kiss the wall. I do. I live very close to it, right? We're not worshiping the wall. We, we, it's our way of just knowing this is a something that was from our ancient time and we it's a way of expressing a love for god we don't worship stones so i say to people who who want to know what christians what muslims believe why don't you just ask them i do i mean shouldn't that be your starting point why don't you read the text muslims detest idolatry hate it and in truth when muslims hear that that Christians, there are some Christians that believe that Muslims worship the moon and the and the Kaaba. Muslims are laughing. They're going, "How could you be so foolish?" So the answer is, ask the Muslim. I thank you very, very much for having me on your show. It's really a joy. Really, I I deeply appreciate that. And wassalamu alaikum to all of you. I thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Rabbi. Thank you so much, Rabbi. Yeah. Thank you so much, Thank you. I wish you can come again to our show. We enjoy for this uh, two hours, almost two hours with you. I pray you well, Rabbi, Thank and you. send our regards to your big family. Thank I you. hope, yeah, I hope uh, everybody protected by uh, God. Thank you so Amen. much, Rabbi. Uh, thank you. Shalom. 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 Terima kasih Pak Ali, Bu Wetika. Sama-sama. Sama-sama Pak Dondi. Mudah-mudahan Rabai mau mau ngobrol lagi ya Pak ya? Ya bisa, ya, sih enggak keberatan. Topik yang khusus barangkali. Ya, baik. Terima kasih Pak Ali, Bu Wetika. Sudah cukup malam. Ya, Saya sempat, terima kasih malam. banyak waktunya Pak, Ibu. Assalamualaikum ya, warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Sama-sama Pak Ali, terima kasih. Terima kasih Pak Ali, Pak Dundi semua. Selamat, selamat malam, selamat tidur ya. ya. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam. Baik, uh, Alhamdulillah ya. Uh, pada malam hari ini kami sudah uh, mendengarkan banyak sekali dan mendapatkan ilmu yang banyak sekali di Rabi Tovia Singer buat para pemirsa ya yang mungkin Bahasa Inggrisnya sedikit-sedikit kurang gitu. Mohon maaf, nanti video ini ya selama hampir dua jam ini nanti akan kami terjemahkan dan akan saya upload di channel saya satu lagi yaitu channel Donditan Subtitle ya. Mohon bersabar karena ini videonya cukup panjang, dua jam ya. Jadi kalau menerjemahkan satu video yang berdurasi kira-kira 20 menit saja itu membutuhkan waktu kira-kira hampir semalam suntuk ya dari pak dari malam kira-kira jam 9 malam itu bisa sampai subuh gitu ya jadi mohon bersabar kalau ini dua jam ya bisa dihitung sendiri ya nah jadi mohon kesabarannya
Youtube di channel Donitan Subtitle. Nah, uh, saya ingin mengucapkan banyak terima kasih atas perhatiannya dari para pemirsa. Mudah-mudahan kajian kita ya, walaupun berbeda keyakinan dengan Rabbi Topia Singer, namun kita banyak belajar perspektif daripada Yudaisme terhadap kekristenan, juga terhadap Islam. Yang jelas, masalah akidah, Yudaisme dan Islam adalah Tauhid. ya. Tapi mengenai kekristenan, kita mendengar sendiri tadi dari Rabbi uh, Topia Singer bagaimana perspektif Yudaisme terhadap kekristenan. ya. Makanya tadi Rabbi uh, Topia Singer juga mengatakan bahwa dia menyayangi orang-orang Kristen dan dia mengajak orang Kristen untuk menyembah Tuhan yang benar-benar hanya satu. Nah, baiklah kalau begitu sebelum saya tutup uh, konten ini, izinkan saya ya uh, seperti biasa mengajak para pemirsa uh, untuk yang mau uh, berpartisipasi untuk membantu perjuangan dakwah kami maupun yang ingin menyalurkan zakat sudah aku infaknya ya. Bagi santri-santri kami, bagi mualaf-mualaf yang kami bina, dan juga bagi pemirsa yang mungkin ingin berpartisipasi di dalam program uh, pembebasan lahan di daerah Wonosalam Jombang, Jawa Timur, ya seluas 6 hektar dengan harga Rp250.000 per meter persegi. Silakan semuanya kirimkan ke Bank Syariah Indonesia atau BSI dengan nomor rekening 31899988 atas nama YPM atau Hid Jakarta dan bukti transfer dapat dikirimkan ke nomor handphone 0812 3280 2080 Barakallahu Fikum semoga partisipasi para pemirsa diterima di sisi Allah SWT sebagai amal jariah amin ya robbal alamin baiklah sekali lagi saya ucapkan banyak terima kasih atas perhatiannya mohon maaf jika masih ada kekurangan di sana sini ya kami selalu memperbaiki kualitas daripada konten-konten kami Wabillahi taufiq wal hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.